Ender's Game, Chapter 12. Bonso. General Pace, sit down. I understand you have come to me about a matter of some urgency. Ordinarily, chronograph, I will not presume to interfere in the internal workings of the battle school. Your autonomy is guaranteed, and despite our difference in ranks, I am quite aware that it is my authority only to advise, not to order you to take action. Action? Do not be disingenuous with me, Colonel Graff. Americans are quite apt at playing stupid when they choose to, but I am not to be deceived. You know why I am here. Ah, oh, I guess this means Dap filed a report. He feels paternal toward these students here. He feels your neglect of a potentially lethal situation is more than negligence. That it borders on conspiracy to cause a death or serious injury of one of the students here. This is a school for children, General Pace. Hardly a matter to bring the chief of IF military police here. Colonel Graf, the name of Ender Wigan has percolated through the high command. It has even reached my ears. I have heard him described modestly as our only hope of victory in the upcoming invasion. When it is his life and health that is in danger, I do not think it untoward that the military police take some interest in preserving and protecting the boy. Do you? Damn, Dap. And damn you too, sir. I know what I'm doing. Do you? Better than anyone else. Oh, that is obvious, since nobody else has the faintest idea what you're doing. You have known for eight days that there is a conspiracy among some of the more vicious of these children to cause the beating of Ender Wigan if they can. And that some members of this conspiracy, notably the boy named Bonito de Madrid, commonly called Bonso, are quite likely to exhibit no self-restraint when his punishment takes place, so that Ender Wigan, an inestimably important international resource, will be placed in serious danger of having his brains pasted on the walls of your orbiting schoolhouse. And you, fully warned of this danger, propose to do exactly nothing. You can see how this excites our puzzlement. Ender Wigan has been in this situation before, back on Earth, the day he lost his monitor, and again, when a large group of older boys, I did not call me or ignorant of the past, Ender Wigan has provoked Bonzometer beyond human endurance, and you have no military police standing by to break up disturbances. It's unconscionable! When Ender Wigan holds our fleet in his control, when he must make the decisions that bring us victory or destruction. Will there be military police to come save him if things get out of hand? I fail to see the connection, obviously. But the connection is there. Ender Wigan must believe that no matter what happens, no adult will ever, ever step in to help him in any way. He must believe to the core of his soul that he can only do what he and the other children work out for themselves. If he does not believe that, then he will never reach the peak of his abilities. He will also not reach the peak of his abilities if he is dead or permanently crippled. He won't be. Why don't you simply graduate, Bonso? He's old enough. Because Ender knows that Bonso plans to kill him. If we transfer Bonso ahead of schedule, he'll know that we saved him. Heaven knows Bonso isn't a good enough commander to be promoted on merit. What about the other children? Getting them to help him. We'll see what happens. That is my first, final, and only decision. God help you if you're wrong. God help us all if I'm wrong. I'll have you before a capital court martial. I'll have your name disgraced throughout the world if you're wrong. Fair enough, but do remember, if I happen to be right, to make sure I get a few medals. For what? For keeping you from meddling. Ender sat in a corner of the battle room, his arm hooked through a handhold, watching Bean practice with his squad. Yesterday they had worked on attacks without guns, disarming enemies with their feet. Ender had helped them with some techniques from gravity personal combat. Many things had to be changed, but inertia in flight was a tool that could be used against the enemy as easily in Nolo as in Earth gravity. Today, though, Bean had a new toy. It was a deadline, one of the thin, almost invisible twines used during construction in space to hold two objects together. Deadlines were sometimes kilometers long. This one was just a bit longer than a wall of the battle room, and yet it looped easily, almost invisibly, around Bean's waist. He pulled it off like an article of clothing and handed one end to one of his soldiers. Hook it to a handhold and wind it around a few times. Bean carried the other end across the battle room. 
As a tripwire, it wasn't too useful, Bean decided. It was invisible enough, but one stranded twine wouldn't have much chance of stopping an enemy that could easily go above or below it. Then he got the idea of using it to change his direction of movement in midair. He fastened it around his waist, the other end still fastened to a handhold, slipped a few meters away, and launched himself straight out. The twine caught him, changed his direction abruptly, and swung him in an arc that crashed him brutally against the wall. He screamed and screamed. It took Ender a moment to realize that he wasn't screaming in pain. Did you see how fast I went? Did you see how I changed direction? Soon all of Dragon Army stopped work to watch Bean practice with the twine. The changes in direction were stunning, especially when you didn't know where to look for the wire. When he used the twine to wrap himself around a star, he attained speeds no one had ever seen before. It was 2140 when Ender dismissed the evening practice, weary but delighted at having seen something new. His army walked through the corridors back to the barracks. Ender walked among them, not talking, but listening to their talk. They were tired, yes, a battle every day for more than four weeks, often in situations that tested their abilities to the utmost. But they were proud, happy, close. They had never lost, and they had learned to trust each other. They trusted their fellow soldiers to fight hard and well, trusted their leaders to use them rather than waste their efforts. Above all, trusted Ender to prepare them for anything and everything that might happen. As they walked the corridor, Ender noticed several older boys seemingly engaged in conversations and branching corridors and ladderways. Some were in their corridor, walking slowly in the other direction. It became too much of a coincidence, however, that so many of them were wearing salamander uniforms, and that those who weren't were often older boys belonging to armies whose commanders most hated Ender Wigan. A few of them looked at him and looked away too quickly. Others were too tense, too nervous as they pretended to be relaxed. What will I do if they attack my army here in the corridor? My boys are all small, young, and completely untrained in gravity combat. When would they learn? Ho, oh, Ender! Someone called. Ender stopped and looked back. It was Petra. Ender, can I talk to you? Ender saw in a moment that if he stopped and talked, his army would quickly pass him by, and he would be alone with Petra in the hallway. Walk with me, Ender said. It's just for a moment. Ender turned around and walked on with his army. He heard Petra running to catch up. All right, I will talk with, I'll walk with you. Ender tensed when she came near. Was she one of them? One of the ones who hated him enough to hurt him? A friend of yours wants me to warn you. There are some boys who want to kill you. Surprise, said Ender. Some of his soldiers seemed to perk up at this. Plots against their commander were interesting news, it seemed. Ender, they can do it. He said they've been planning it ever since you went commander. Ever since I, went, I beat Salamander, you mean. I hated you after you beat Phoenix Army too, Ender. I didn't say I blamed anybody. It's true. He told me to take you aside today and warn you, on the way back from the battle room, to be careful tomorrow because... Petra, if you had actually taken me aside just now, there are about a dozen boys following along who would have taken me in the corridor. Can you tell me you didn't notice them? Suddenly her face flushed. No, I didn't. How can you think I did? Don't you know who your friends are? She pushed her way through Dragon Army, got ahead of him, and scrambled up a ladder way to a higher deck. Is it true? asked Crazy Tom. Is what true? Ender scanned the room and shouted for two roughhousing boys to get to bed. That some of the other boys want to kill you. I'll talk, said Ender, but he knew that it wasn't. Pedro had known something, and what he saw on the way there tonight wasn't imagination. It may be all talk, but I hope you'll understand when I say you've got five tune leaders who are going to escort you to your room tonight. Completely unnecessary. Humorous, you owe us a favor. I owe you nothing. He'd be a fool to turn them down. Do as you want. He turned and left. The two leaders trotted along with him. One ran ahead and opened his door. They checked the room, made Ender promise to lock it, and left him just before lights out. There was a message on his desk. Don't be alone. Ever. Dink. Ender grinned. So Dink was still his friend. Don't worry. That won't, they won't do anything to me. I have my army. But in the darkness, he did not have his army. He dreamed that night of Stilson, only he saw now how small Stilson was. 
only six years old, how ridiculous his tough guy posturing was. And yet, in the dream, Stilson and his friends tied Ender so he couldn't fight back. And then, everything that Ender had done to Stilson in life, they did to Ender in the dream. And afterward, Ender saw himself babbling like an idiot, trying hard to give orders to his army, but all his words came out as nonsense. He awoke in darkness, and he was afraid. Then he calmed himself by remembering that the teachers obviously valued him, or they wouldn't be putting so much pressure on him. They wouldn't let anything happen to him. Nothing bad, anyway. Probably when the older kids attacked him in the battle room years ago, there were teachers just outside the room, waiting to see what would happen. If things had gotten out of hand, they would have stepped in and stopped it. I probably could have sat there and done nothing, and they would have seen to it I came through all right. They'll push me as hard as they can in the game, but outside the game, they'll keep me safe. With that assurance, he slept again, until the door opened softly, and the morning's war was left on the floor for him to find. <laughs>